Good afternoon. So pleased to welcome you here to Cal Poly's Advanced Technologies Laboratory. It's not really a laboratory, is it? Um, it's a great hall and a great venue for our speaker this afternoon. And uh, we've had a great uh, time over in the library with the Innovation Showcase and uh, our careers and conversations and the wonderful exhibit that the library staff has put together for us, uh, which will be up through um, the middle of December. So if you didn't get a chance to go through it all today, please avail yourself of that opportunity. It's a great exhibit about the history of Cal Poly student media. I'm Mary Glick. I'm the chair of the journalism department. We are hosting this e series of events this weekend to celebrate 100 years of delivering the news. The history of uh, Cal Poly is chronicled by the student media uh, through various platforms uh, through all of that time, all the way from the polygram of 1916 to today's multi-platform, multimedia news organization, Mustang News. And a lot of our students are here with us today and really pleased to welcome them. I'm going to introduce to you um, the introducer of our speaker today, and we're really pleased to have her with us. Um, Sandy Doerr. Sandra Doerr is the executive editor and vice president of the Tribune, uh, the daily newspaper here in San Luis Obispo. And uh, she has known Susan uh, Goldberg from National Geographic for several years and was instrumental in inviting her to come to speak with us today. So, Sandy, I'm going to turn over the microphone. There will be some time for a brief Q&A uh, after Susan's presentation. And I would ask you, please, we are live streaming this event and recording it. So please hold your question until a microphone is brought to you and you can ask it and we can have it for the audience at home. So thank you very much. Susan uh, will be introduced by Sandy Doerr. Thank you, Mary. As, Mary's, oops, as Mary said, I am honored to introduce Susan, who I have long admired for her outstanding journalism and leadership in our profession. Her illustrious career has spanned newspapers, a news service, and now National Geographic, where she is editorial director of National Geographic Partners and editor-in-chief of National Geographic Magazine. As editorial director, she is in charge of all publishing ventures, including digital journalism, magazines, books, maps, children and family, as well as travel and adventure. She was named editorial director in October 2015 and editor-in-chief of the magazine in January 2014. Under her leadership last year, National Geographic Magazine received two National Magazine Awards as well as the prestigious George Polk Award for magazine reporting. Before joining National Geographic, Susan was executive editor for federal, state, and local government coverage for Bloomberg News in Washington, editor of The Plain Dealer in Cleveland, Ohio, and executive editor of the San Jose Mercury News. She began her career as a reporter in Seattle at the Seattle Post Intelligencer, then worked as a reporter and editor at the Detroit Free Press as well as USA Today. Through the years, Susan has garnered much recognition. I'll mention just two of them. In 2013, she was voted one of Washington's 11 most influential women in the media by Washingtonian Magazine. And in March 2015, she received the Exceptional Woman in Publishing Award from Exceptional Women in Publishing. A Michigan native, Susan has a bachelor's degree in journalism from Michigan State University, where she now funds the Susan Goldberg Scholarship at the College of Communication Arts and Sciences School of Journalism. She's active in many professional journalism associations, and in 2012-2013 was president of the American Society of News Editors. Susan is now on the boards of the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press and the College of Communication, Arts, and Sciences at Michigan State. She's also on the board of the National Museum for Women in the Arts in Washington and is a member of the International Women's Forum. Please join me in welcoming Susan today as she takes us inside the venerable National Geographic to share how a legacy institution such as that is succeeding in this digital age. And I'll, oops, I'll, I'll share with you that she gave this presentation to the Tribune staff over lunch, and it's dynamite. So I'm looking forward to seeing it again. Thank you.
Well, I'm feeling a little pressure now. <laughs> Everybody's looking for a dynamite presentation. Well, I am really delighted to be here today. Thank you so much for having me. I love talking about the work that we're doing at National Geographic because, you know, National Geographic is a global super brand. Uh, we appeal to people from 8 to 80, and we are all over the world. And how you take this wonderful institution and remake it for the digital age is really what we're here to talk about today. So, okay, I'm clicking. I'm still clicking. I might need technical help. What do we think? Uh-huh. Okay, wait, this. Forward, okay, here we go. <laughs> Ready for the digital age, obviously. <laughs> so, when people think about National Geographic, a lot of people think of, think of this. And this is the way, in fact, about 55 million people all over the world still enjoy National Geographic. We publish in 35 languages, and I know most people in the United States have no idea. So I always am hearing from people about how their grandfathers or their uncles or their dads have, you know, 9,000 pounds of National Geographic in the <laughs> attic or the basement or somewhere. But the truth is, this is more like today's National Geographic. So you know, that slide has is, is got a blank space in it. And where that blank space is, there was supposed to be something, and I'll tell you what that is. But this is, this is my world at National Geographic. So I'm in, in charge of the media at National Geographic Partners. So we've got National Geographic Magazine, National Geographic Traveler Magazine. That blank spot is um, supposed to be, uh, we, we publish um, many newsstand publications, and there was a picture of one. We've got a book division. We are the largest uh, nonfiction publisher in the United States. And then we've got all of our digital media. And you can see there's our Facebook page. There's nationalgeographic.com. And then there's Instagram. And I'm going to talk with you a little bit about all of them. But one of the things I want to make sure I mention is at National Geographic Partners, we give back 27% of our profits to the nonprofit National Geographic Society. And I am really proud of that because I don't think there is another media company in the world that can say that it gives 25% of its profits to a nonprofit for science, exploration, and education. These days, though, the way we understand we're going to have to tell stories more and more is on digital and on mobile. And I understand that mobile is really going to be the most important for us. It is the fastest growing part of our readership. And I think it creates a wonderful opportunity for us to forge a new relationship with our readers. Because the truth is, is their lives don't live in the yellow border of National Geographic magazine. But their lives do live on this device. They use that device to tell the story of their own lives for themselves, their friends, and their families. So I do believe it creates an intimacy that we don't get with the magazine. So increasingly, on this device and on these small screens, people are going to come in contact with our professional journalism. And that's journalism like this. This is just an epic picture taken by Charlie Hamilton James. Those are the Grand Tetons in the background. And he took it, it was in our May issue, which was all about uh, Yellowstone. And I think it's really one of the best pictures that we ran all year. And they'll see journalism like this. This picture also was taken by Charlie. And he took it in Manu National Park in Peru, which is one of the most biodiverse places on Earth. It's also a place that has the, a large number of uncontacted and little contacted tribes. And you can see how shocked these women are when they see uh, Charlie and, and all of his photographic equipment and, um, you know, and his entourage. And they'll see pictures like this. We, 
This is a picture that we just got in a couple of weeks ago. It was taken by our underwater photographer, Brian Scarry, about 100 miles off of the coast of San Diego. And here you've got this, this seal in a kelp forest. This is one of the areas that President Obama is being urged to uh, turn into a marine sanctuary. And I think we're going to be seeing a lot more talk about that as he leaves office. This will be a, a, in a story in our magazine in February. And they'll see journalism like this. This came out of our September issue, and it was a story about blindness. Forty million people all over the world are blind. And what our story looked at was how close we are to either curing or preventing almost all blindness. And in places like India, where this is taken, it could be something as simple as a cataract operation. And here, where we've already done all the cataract operations, there's just incredible high-tech medicine going on that is absolutely allowing blind people to see, a story that I was really, really proud of. So let me talk a little bit about our, our, the reach of our, of our brand. Like I said, it really is a global super brand. Uh, so we've got you know, the 55 million people reading the magazine. Uh, you've got National Geographic Channel, which is the most widely distributed cable channel in the world. We've got an expeditions business. We have an events business. We have our book and our other magazine business. And then we've got social and digital. And the two numbers up here, well, the three really to look at, are Facebook, which is becoming one of our most important distribution platforms, like it is, I think, for almost all media. Um, Twitter is good for us. Instagram is huge. We've got 80 million followers on Instagram, about 60 million on our main account. And I think it has been so successful because we really turned over the keys of our, to our Instagram account to our trusted photographers. We gave them the rules of the road and we said, tell these stories. And I think it's that authentic storytelling voice of our photographers that has made this so successful with readers. And then the other one really to look at there is Snapchat. You know, we didn't really do much on Snapchat until about a year ago. And now we've got 19 million, mostly young people, coming to us every month to look at National Geographic stories in a completely different way. So that makes me feel really good that we are reaching this next generation of users and readers. But let me go back to Instagram. So let me show you the three most popular pictures that we published on Instagram last year. So. So here is a baby harp seal taken by Brian Scarry, that terrific underwater photographer. And uh, this baby harp seal got 664,000 likes. So this was number three. Our second most popular picture last year, this was taken by photographer Amy Vitale. And she did that uh, while reporting a story for us about how China is breeding and rewilding pandas, trying to get this endangered species back into the wild. And this ran in our June, um, June issue of National Geographic magazine. And there were just like zillions of pictures of baby pandas. It could not be cuter. Um, 735,000 likes. And here's the most popular picture that we published on Instagram last year. <laughs> OK. Baby emperor penguin. Uh, taken by Paul Nicklin, who is a specialist in Arctic and underwater photography. And this has 787,000 likes. OK, so well, what can we conclude from all of this? People like baby animals. <laughs> but what we have learned on Instagram is people are not afraid of looking at a lot grittier content as well. This picture uh, is from an expedition that we undertook to Myanmar. We sent a writer, a videographer, a photographer, and three climbers to try to climb the highest peak in Southeast Asia. And they went on this incredible <coughs> expedition. It took literally months. And it completely fell apart. They ran out of food. They turned on each other. They never made it to the top of the mountain at all, in fact. And our photographer, Corey Richards, he writes, let me see if I can read it. <laughs> he writes, here we go. Sunburned, filthy, and exhausted. 
After months in the jungle, climbing mountains, and the slow, steady stripping of social niceties and veneers, the reduction to our most basic and raw existence. And this on Instagram had about 250,000 likes. And here's a picture of our three incredibly emaciated climbers. And the reason I wanted to show you this particular story on Instagram is not only is it gritty, interesting content, it's a far cry from baby animals, but because it increasingly illustrates how we're managing to deal with stories across platforms. So we told this story first, digitally, here on Instagram. And a few months later, it became a full-length feature story in National Geographic magazine. And it had all of the incredible photography by Corey Richards. It had a deeply and richly reported story. It had wonderful, wonderful maps and graphics. So this, this is our new model, really. We are using all of these different platforms to tell stories on. We're using them in ways that make sense for each platform. And we tell the story um, at the time it makes sense to on each platform. So, Whenever I talk about National Geographic storytelling, people are always asking, how do you decide what stories to, what, how do you decide what stories to pursue? And you know, for a long time, this was very mysterious to me because our motto had been that we covered the world and everything that was in it. Well, I thought that was way too broad of a mission and in fact was almost paralyzingly broad. So we started talking about what are the most important principles of the stories that we want to tell? And so now these, we came up with these five, and I'm going to talk about each of them. But I hope every story that we do for National Geographic, no matter what platform it runs on, is going to hit at least one of these storytelling principles, if not more than one. So first, we need to tell stories that matter, stories that people care about, about important issues, stories where we can move the needle. And here's a good example. We have a writer named Paul Salapak who is actually walking across, around the world. He started in Ethiopia in the cradle of mankind, and he's going to walk all the way to the tip of South America. This is a large undertaking. It is an eight-year, 21,000-mile walk. So last year, he was walking <coughs> along the border between southern Turkey and Syria. And right in front of him and our photographer, John Stanmeyer, all of these refugees literally came rushing across the border, fleeing ISIS and the terrible civil war, pushing through a fence. And so, of course, they, they took pictures and they wrote about the story right then for NationalGeographic.com because we don't just publish a monthly magazine. We put out news and information when it happens. So here it is on NationalGeographic.com. And then a few months later, that incredible coverage by John and Paul was in National Geographic magazine. And this is a picture that I think is one of the strongest pictures that I've seen in a long time. You know, photography is so powerful because it transcends language. It even transcends literacy. And so you look at that little boy, and you look at that family, and you can understand pretty much everything you need to know about the refugee crisis. So this is a story that matters. And it's a story that matters so much that we have continued covering it. This is from our October issue, the current issue of National Geographic magazine. And we looked at Syrians coming, coming to Germany specifically. But we tried to put that in the context of you know, more than a century of these waves of, of immigrants coming to Europe. So we looked at Turks coming to Germany in the 70s, and uh, Algerians coming to France, and Somalis coming to, to Denmark and Sweden. And we, we, we are able to tell this story in a deep way. And one of the things that we wanted to do in this story is to really focus on the people. Everybody hears about the refugee crisis, but you don't really hear, see that much of the people. So we sent a, a portrait photographer named Robin Hammond into Germany to take pictures of these Syrian immigrants who were coming here. And the old man, the patriarch of this family, says, we're doing fine here, and we were well received. But we want to go back to Syria. And this man, 
he shows that this is how he carried his daughter all the way from Syria to Germany. And he had to leave his wife in Greece. They all, the whole family got separated. And he said what he wanted was a simple and normal life that this nightmare will end. And here's another family. And these are Syrians. They're in Germany. They're actually safe. But they turn their back to the camera. And they're afraid because a relative in Syria joined ISIS. And the, the man of the family says, despite the danger, we want to go home. A person can't change his state of belonging. So these are stories that matter. And here's another story that matters. Last year, we sent a photographer named Pete Muller to Sierra Leone, which was at the center of the Ebola epidemic. So he did five stories, four online, and one for the magazine. And you know, people are always talking about authentic journalism and authentic storytelling. So I will show you some authentic storytelling. This is a really kind of horrific scene behind me here. Uh, an advanced Ebola patient who's quite delusional. Sometimes the disease is intense. It causes delusions in the mind. And this guy has tried to escape from one of the highly quarantined war, uh, wards here in this holding facility at Hastings uh, and made a break into this back area. He's sicker than anyone I've ever seen. Uh, and he's now being guarded by, uh, by, by a police officer with a weapon, and they're going to try to move him. This is really the, the, the graphic elements of how bad Ebola can be. So I'm very proud of these stories, and these are important stories for us to do. Because when Ebola fell off the front page of American newspapers after it became clear that Ebola was not going to sweep the United States, it's still happening in Africa, and it will come back. And so we need to understand what's going on with that. So next, we've got to do stories that other people can't do. We can't be CNN. We can't be the New York Times. We've got to do stories that are unique to us. So we'll do stories that other people can't do because they don't have our global reach or our incredible visual journalism, or they just may not have our crazy ambition. So let me introduce you to a crazy ambitious project called PhotoArc. And this is a 25-year project by our photographer, Joel Sartori. And he has set out to take portraits of 12,000 different animals. And he always takes them on black backgrounds or white backgrounds. And almost always, the animals are making eye contact with you. And the reason he's doing this is because if we stay on the trajectory that we're now on, half of those 12,000 animals will be gone by 2100. What I love about this project is Joel doesn't just take pictures of the famous animals. He doesn't just take pictures of the lions or the tigers or the bears. But he takes pictures of the little animals, too, of the rats and the snails and the frogs. And what Joel says is, I want people to care. I want them to fall in love and I want them to take action. And that is a pretty good 15-word mission statement for all the storytelling we like to do at National Geographic. We like Joel's project so much that in April, we did something we have never done, which was we put all these different portraits on the cover. And so they were distributed randomly. So if you subscribe to National Geographic, you might have gotten the peacock, but you might have gotten the frog. And so we have never, ever done this. So that's one way, one platform, that we're telling the photo arc story. Here's another.
So that's fantastic. That's video on nationalgeographic.com. But for those 19 million young users on Snapchat, this is how they're going to see the same story. we are disaggregating our journalism content and then figuring out how to put it on different platforms in the way that it makes sense. But if you want to talk about storytelling that nobody else can do, let me also mention this wonderful project we did. This is the mouth of a tiger shark. And it was the first of three months of stories that we did about sharks over the summer, June, July, and August. We had tiger sharks, great white sharks, and then oceanic white tips. And I don't know about you all, but in Washington, everybody likes to talk about, you know, oh, they swim with the sharks because it's a really tough town, and, or their office is really tough. Maybe it's that way here at, here at Cal Poly, I don't know. But let me show you what it's really like to swim with the sharks. <laughs> I do think Brian is a little crazy <laughs> to, to put himself in that situation. And I asked him, I said, isn't it just so scary to do that? And he, he always says he's a lot more afraid of some of the people who walk the earth than he is of those sharks in the water. But Brian, like all of our photographers, is also an inventor. I don't know if you noticed, but he created a fake seal there. And he did that so he could get a picture of that great white shark jumping on it and biting it. So like I say, we've got to do things that nobody else can do. So next, we've got to be part of the conversation. I think back when National Geographic was a monthly magazine and only a monthly magazine, it was hard to be part of the conversation. But now, not only is it not hard, it's expected, and correctly so by our audience, that we be part of the conversation. And so these days, if you want to be part of, this, of the conversation, you've really got to talk about social media. So we are the number one social media brand in the United States. Um, this always just kills me. So we're bigger than the NBA. We're bigger than the NFL. I mean, we are even bigger than Victoria's Secret. <laughs> who would have really, who would have really, really thought? And another part of being part of the conversation is literally getting people to engage with your content. So this is not a pretty slide, but it has an important message. This is looking at our Facebook posts in this last, just in this last quarter. So average engagement per post. And what this shows you is that we are up at about 19,000 engagements per post on Facebook. And by engagements, we mean like, comment, or share. So 19,000 people for every, uh, you know, for, for every post. And there you can see how we stack up against some of our competition. So I really feel like the, the content that we are putting out there is really engaging with this audience. But when you want to be part of a conversation, sometimes you have to start the conversation. So I'm going to give you a preview of something that we're going to do in January that I think will start a lot of conversation. This is a working cover. Uh, as you can see, we aren't going to really publish with those X's. Uh, but it is on gender. We are going to devote the entire magazine in January to the subject of gender. So not only do we look at the roles of boys and girls and men and women all over the world, but we also will be looking at the science of gender. So 
is gender, if you look at the science, is gender really a binary boy-girl choice? Or, as increasingly the science is showing, is it more of a spectrum of gender? And only lately have people been allowed to express anything other than the boy-girl uh, duality. So I'm going to show you a video. And what this video is based on is we went all over the world and we talked to nine-year-olds. And we talk to nine-year-olds because nine-year-olds are really smart and they're articulate, but they do not have that social veil. They will actually tell you the truth and they will reflect our world back to us. So we talk to these kids, what is it like to be a boy where you live? What is it like to be a girl? What makes you happy? What makes you sad? How would your life be different if you were somebody of the other gender? Here's some of what these kids had to say. Um, my name is Hildy Kate Lezak. I'm nine years old and I'm of you and I'm nine years old. The best thing being a girl is, be is because that girls can do a little bit more things than boys can. Boys are better than girls because they can, they are really strong than girls. The best thing about being a girl is now I don't have to pretend to be a boy. I can just be a girl. Yeah, the worst thing about being a girl is that you just can't do things that boys can do. The worst thing about being a boy is your underarm pitch things. Like, it kind of bothers me how there, there was not one girl president. Now I'm really up. Eu acho que na aparência são um pouco mais diferenciadas. If I was a girl, my life would be very strange and odd. The hair always comes in your face. It would be very, very irritating with the long hair. Even though I keep back, I can sell your car. If I was a girl, I would have to play Barbies. I won't be able to play boy games. I don't want to be involved in the secrets of my life. Well, there's not many things I can do as a girl. There's like barely anything I can do. Something that makes me sad is thinking of my dad killing another animal because it's like a person. I used to go to my dad's house and then one day he left me on the porch. I got bullied before at school and then after that I never saw him again. He just pushed me against the wall then left without saying sorry. If I could change sort of the world, I would stop people from bullying. I would make the roads able to fit four cars so there would be less traffic. I would not change anything because I like what I have and what I don't have. A chocolate um, house. I would live in that house and I would eat it every day. You have to appreciate what you have than what you don't have. When I grow up, I want to be a professional grandpa. The first Indian president. I want to be a Navy SEAL. I want to be a professional grandpa. I want to be a professional grandpa. I want to be a professional grandpa. I want to be a dentist, banker, or a computer like genius guy. I am going to help kids have good teeth, not have cavities. Yay, we're done! 
So I just, I love, I love this story. I love this content. I think it's so important. And I haven't talked much about how we're coordinating with our colleagues on the television side, but they are actually going to produce a special in late December timed with the publication of the magazine on the gender revolution. And it's going to be narrated or, or, or uh, uh, moderated, produced by Katie Couric. So I think that will really be a terrific thing. I'd also like to do a book on these kids. You know, we took pictures of about 90 of these kids all over the world, and we shot them in the United States, Canada, <coughs> Kenya, Brazil, India, China, Israel, and the Palestinian territories. And so you've got this amazing treasure trove of beautiful portraits, astounding quotes, and really it's a nine-year-old's interpretation of the world. And I think it is, it is very, very moving. So I'm looking forward to this. You know, next, we've got to act urgently. I'm sure in all of your jobs and, and here at Cal Poly, this does not seem like a, like a novel concept, but I can say it, at one time, it did feel like a little bit of a novel concept at National Geographic. Um, you know, it was a monthly magazine, and that is what it did, and it did it on this very rote and set schedule. Obviously, now all of that is changing. And so here's a good example. So when Elon Musk comes out, like he did a couple of weeks ago, to talk about colonizing Mars and how he was going to pull that off. This is a story that we covered in real time, and we did that because we cover space all the time. But we've also got some big, big plans for coverage coming up in November all about space. So in November, <coughs> our cover will be on Mars. Uh, this is, it's a, Well, our cover will be on Mars. There we go. It's a, it's a really terrific story, and it is going to coordinate with a show on National Geographic Channel that is all about what it would really take to get to Mars um, and what it would, how people could really live there. So inside the magazine, we're going to do one of our big posters. Uh, here's the front of that poster. This is really the best map of Mars that anybody's produced in about the last 25 years. I'm very excited. It shows every single mission to Mars that has been launched by any country in the world and, and what happened to it, and really um, helps people understand the surface of the planet. And there will be all kinds of digital and social around this story. And then on the flip side of that map, we've got this, which is taking the best science that we know of today on how, if we were to go to Mars, how would we have to live there? And as you can see, we would have to live in the lava tubes because of the, because of the ultraviolet uh, radiation. So get ready for November. National Geographic magazine, we've got a Mars book coming out. We've got the television show I mentioned, and even our kids' magazine is going to have a kids' version of going to Mars. And the reason that we're doing this is increasingly, it is really hard to cut through the media clutter. It is hard to cut through the din of content. There is so much information out there. So we think that by putting the content across platforms, we can get heard a lot better. Now, when big news events happen, we're always trying to figure out at National Geographic, how do we cover it? Because we're not CNN, we're not the New York Times. So when there was that awful shooting in Orlando back in June at the uh, Pulse nightclub, that shooting killed 49 people. It wounded 53. So it was the deadliest mass shooting by a single shooter in the United States ever. It was the deadliest attack since September 11th in the United States, and it was the worst incidence of violence against the LGBT community in US history. So we felt like we had to do something, but we didn't know what. And then we thought, we will go in with our unique brand of visual journalism. So we sent Wayne Lawrence, who is a portrait photographer, down to Orlando. And here he talked to Victor Argalis and Brandon Haggard. And Victor says, when I first came out as a homosexual, I went to Pulse as a place of safety. It was a place where I thought other people were like me. I can't describe to you the feeling of being around other people that accept you the way that you are. And he took this picture here of Willie Williams. And Willie said, 
This week, I've spent more time with friends, praying, hugging, kissing, saying that God loves you all. He does love us all. That is what I'll forever believe. And here are three friends, and Izzy Vasquez is in the middle. And Izzy didn't learn about the shooting until the next morning because his phone was turned off. And he said, when he turned his phone on, he said, my phone, it started ringing like crazy. The entire night, my mom, my sister, everyone in my family was calling me because my brother had just recently died. So everyone was worried that something had happened to me too. And finally, you have to know who you are. At National Geographic, we have to understand why people come to our content. They come to get science content and stories about animals and the natural world and about history. So these were the best-selling covers that we have published in the last several years. And I'm really I'm pleased by this selection because it tells me, in fact, People are coming to us for who we are. So you've got science stories. You've got stories about, about earliest man, about the, the human family tree, about the global cultural phenomenon that is the Virgin Mary, about Yellowstone, the most iconic and first national park in the United States, a breakthrough story about cutting edge science, and then about that blindness story I had mentioned. Now, I will tell you the best selling of all of these covers was, which one do you think? Weed. weed. <laughs> Apparently everybody bought it. Um, that weed cover has sold more than any other cover in the last four years. Uh, our top selling cover, Mary, interestingly, was number two. And Yellowstone was number three. So I think that that really kind of hits on all of those, those areas that we want to hit on at National Geographic. What I always think about um, with millennials is, I, I think, to paint with a little bit of a broad brush, that this is a generation that wants to do good. And this is a generation that cares about the environment and about climate change and about scientific innovation and about species preservation. And these are the things that we cover naturally at National Geographic and always have. And so it is, you know, it is our bad if we cannot connect to this next generation audience. But I think, I think that we really are. So let me just end with one last video about our storytelling and then I am happy to take your questions. person can make a difference. The world needs a lot more conservationists and a lot more scientists. We think we know this place, but we don't. We think we understand how things work, but we don't. That's why exploration is so fundamentally important. It's about telling a story that resonates with all sorts of people all over the world. It's the elation that you get by saving a life. Dude, you're not that much older. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> It doesn't matter if I can't feel my fingers. It doesn't matter how my face stings and feels like it's getting sandblasted. It matters that somebody else can feel that by looking at a picture. The most important message is that every individual matters. And every individual makes a difference every day.
So I feel like I've spent 35 years as an evangelist for journalism that makes a difference. But nowhere in my career have I ever been anywhere where I feel like we have a better chance of telling the stories that do make a difference and the stories that can change the world than right now at National Geographic. So thank you very much. And we've, we've gone a little over, so we're just going to take one or two quick questions. Okay, probably one question. Probably one question. Right here. It better be a good one. <laughs> Are there any, like, internship opportunities at National <laughs> Geographic? All right. Can you hook me up? If you go to nationalgeographic.com and look at careers, we do have, we do have summer internships and actually uh, year-round internships. Awesome. But can Thank we take you. one more question? <laughs> How about this lady right here? Oh, so sorry. Could you cover the um, Native American uh, in North Dakota trying to stop the pipeline? It's not getting coverage in the national mainstream media. Maybe National Geographic could be a great place for it. You know, that it's interesting. We were just talking about the Keystone Pipeline and those protests that are breaking out. And I think this is an example of one of those stories that we will cover digitally first and then perhaps repurpose it into print. But anyway, thank you all very much. Appreciate it. Okay, we're going to take a quick we're going to take a quick